Okay. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting of the Westchester County Planning Board to order. Um, we have the next three meeting dates, uh, and they say 8.30. So does that mean we're going to be meeting in person, or we don't know, or what's up, Norma? Okay, so um, when I checked in with the county attorney yesterday afternoon, the executive order regarding open meetings had not yet been extended. He was expecting it to happen late yesterday if it was going to occur. Um, so, but we have made arrangements that if it works for August or we can do it for September, that we can use Port Chester's Abendroth Park, which has a pavilion, it has restrooms, so we would have the opportunity to be outside. It is centrally located. It's it's very close to the um, to 287 and to I-95. So if you would like to meet there the morning of August 4th, we can do it at either 8.30 or at 9 o'clock. It doesn't matter. Um, we I think I'm going to have at least one housing development on your agenda. So that's why as of right now, we're thinking there is a need for an August board meeting. Um, okay, if we hear from the from the state that they have extended the possibility of using uh, virtual meetings, would we then just go to a virtual meeting or either way we'll go to Abendroth Park? Well, I think what I'd like to do is actually schedule the meeting, let you see Abendroth. So Abendroth Park was a CDBG project. It's next to an affordable housing development. It's next to United Hospital. Um, so, you know, you get an idea of a potential for a potential redevelopment within the village of Port Chester. So it, it gives you an opportunity to see something that we've done anyway. Um, and then in the event that the weather is not good, then we would revert to the WebEx for that specific meeting and then push Avondroth Park off to September. Okay. Um, will you be able to record the meeting? Uh, we don't need to if we're having an in-person meeting, but right. we can set up a range with communications to have it visually recorded, to have it videotaped. But we have been, rec we did in the past record in, per in person. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, does anyone have an objection to going to Abendroth Park outdoors for the August meeting? Okay, so I don't, not hearing any. We Can we just determine what's the appropriate time to start? Um, uh, I, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Want to make it nine o'clock? It'll give a little more time for people to get there. It's can somebody be, just? Can we check? Can they yes. hear me? Nine o'clock sounds good. Can somebody just check the bus schedule and see what the bus schedule is that arrives at this park, please? Before we set the time. Uh, that's fine. Naomi's actually online. Perhaps Naomi can check that for us. Okay, let's move ahead and uh, we'll get, uh, you'll notice us as soon as uh, It'll be nine o'clock if the bus schedule is appropriate or adjusted if necessary. Um, I'm trying to think. It's not exactly near a bus line. Um, it's a bit of a walk from Post Road, but uh, okay, you'll check that out. It, there's probably a bus on on South Regent there, so. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's go to the minutes uh, first of the June 5th meeting. Uh, you, you've got yesterday. You got the revised minutes. Um, does anyone else have any other revisions or corrections to make to the June 5th mi minute? This is Dwight. I'll move them as presented. Can we have a second. Uh, Kathy, I'll second. Thank you. Bill, call the roll. All right. Uh, all in favor, James Arndt? Yeah, but Robert Barron is on the phone. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dwight Douglas? Yes. Daniel Finger? Yes. Jimena Franchella? 
Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Hugh Gretchen or G Gail for Hugh? Yes. Holly Hasbrook? Yes. Richard Hyman? Yes. Vincent Kopicki? Yes. Kathy O'Connor? Yes. Bernie Stones? Yes. Rini Toback? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, the minutes for the meeting of June 23rd, which was the meeting on the Mount Pleasant site plan. Uh, there were a couple of um, revisions there. Does anyone have any future, any other revisions or corrections? Uh, Richard, uh, Vincent Kopicki just contacted us today to note that he was at the meeting, so we'll reflect the minutes uh, well, for today's meeting that I'm saying that, and also for the June 23rd meeting that he was in, at the meeting. Okay, thank you. Any Anyone else have any comments on the June 23rd minutes? I'll move them as directed. Thank you, Dwight. Second, please. Sure, Rini. Thank you, Rini. Call the roll, Bill. Okay. Uh, James Arndt. Yep, I. Robert Barron. I think Robert Robert's on the phone. Robert. Okay, I'll move along to Dwight. Douglas? Aye. I, I, I heard Robert I also. Daniel Finger? Aye. Jimena Franchella? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Gail for Hugh Grecian? Aye. Holly Hasbrook? Aye. Richard Hyman? Aye. Vincent Kopicki? Yes. Kathy O'Connor? Aye. Bernie Tomes? Aye. And Rini Toback? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll go to Chairman's remarks. Uh, I will give an update on the Mount Pleasant site plan that we had the special meeting for. Uh, we sent a letter, everyone saw the letter. The Chairman of the Mount Pleasant Planning Board thought it was an excellent letter and actually felt that it was that he thought they should vote at, they met on july 2nd he felt they shouldn't vote on july 2nd that there were too many outstanding issues and his board didn't agree with him and they they voted for i don't know if he eventually voted yes or no to approve the site plan the one change they made was the crosswalk which during the middle of the meeting the applicant emailed a revised plan, including the crosswalk. Uh, but all of the other issues we brought up, they basically ignored and they approved the site plan. We did send the letters out, copies to the adjoining municipalities, as is our new policy. And uh, I guess we move on. So that's my remark. Uh, Norma, you have any commissioner's remarks? Uh, sure. So, as you can all imagine, census, 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 we're still in the middle of things. August 11th is when the census enumerators will start going out into the field. So, I mean, all in all, we're doing well, but there's definitely still uh, issues in certain municipalities that we're, um, and we're still promoting it. We actually have a new ad campaign that's going to start on TV next week and run for three weeks. And then our, uh, we have new uh, signs in our buses and on our bus shelters with the message that 40% um, of Westchester residents think they don't matter, don't be one of them. So again, just trying to get everybody's attention to the fact that we've gotten a 60% response right now, but we're not there yet. Uh, Ted's gonna take you into more specific detail. I want to give you an update on the CARES Act, the additional funding that has come uh, to the county through the planning department uh, for assistance, not just with our consortium communities, um, but, uh, but an additional program as well with the coronavirus relief funds. So mm -hmm. under the CARES Act, the consortium receives, is going to receive $2.1 million of CDBG that's going to be used with $1.2 million going to direct grants to businesses of $10,000 each. We're going to be doing that through Community Capital New York. 
Uh, we've allocated $400,000 to assist with emergency food distribution because we know uh, in our, by the way, in our eight neediest or eight uh, low mod, eight municipalities with the highest low mod percentages, because we know that nonprofits have just been hit so hard with how many people are showing up for all the food distributions. Uh, and then there's another $380,000 under the CDBG grant to be able to just assist some of our nonprofits with a particular emphasis with those that are focused on housing, mental health issues, or daycare issues. Um, so in all that's, uh, that's the, 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 and then that's 2.1 million under CDBG. There should be another allocation of CDBG coming at some point subject to the secretary's um, discretion, but that hasn't been announced. But the ESG program where we originally started with an original allocation of 1.1 million, the consortium is now getting an extra 4.1 million dollars. So we're going to be getting 5.2 million dollars for to provide programs that will essentially help people in imminent danger of becoming homeless. So this is going to allow us to do a significant amount of eviction prevention as well as create a short term or medium term rental assistance program that will be able to help families pay their rent for the for up to 12 months legally or st by statute. I can really go to 24 months. But we've created a program so that uh, we're going to give emphasis to people who are either in phase four of reopening or who are work for businesses that are not returning, recognizing that these were folks that were working before. We don't ever want them to get into the homeless system, but you know, so we want to be able to give them security with their housing until they can find a new job. So total of that is now $7.3 million under the CARE Act, CARES Act for the 27 consortium communities uh, that you know, are in the consortium right now. We are also getting an extra $750,000 under the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which will help us enable uh, 30 nonprofits that uh, run either soup kitchens or food pantries to just be able to give them each a $25,000 grant to continue what they do to be able to keep getting food out onto the people who are either living on the streets or the people who are showing up looking for hungry, you know, showing up looking for food. Um, my last point is for fiscal year 2021, we will actually now have three municipalities joining the consortium. I do want to thank Dwight Douglas for his extra pitch to get the city of Peekskill on board. They did act on that last Monday, um, so that was great. And then Newcastle and Tuckahoe had already previously advised us that they were going to be re rejoining. So for 2021, the consortium will now be up to 30 municipalities. That's my report, Richard. Okay, thank you, Norma. Um, Next is referrals, ratification of actions taken by staff in response to planning and zoning actions referred to the County Planning Board May 16th through June 15th, 2020. Does anyone have any comments on those referrals? Richard, yeah, yeah. I have just, just a small comment on Greenberg 20-005. Um, um, there was just a comment about widening the driveway. I just wanted to ask if we could not widen the driveway. It's already very wide and uh, makes the crosswalk much more dangerous. But that's it. Otherwise, we're an excellent referral. Okay. And Richard? Uh, yeah. This is Go Bernie ahead. Toms. I like to excuse myself from the Greenberg uh, Manhattan Avenue Senior LLC project. Okay. So noted. Any other comments? Okay, I have two comments. The first is on the Briarcliff Manor zoning text amendment. It says, we have not received a complete description or narrative of the proposed regulations. Have, Michael Vernon, have we subsequently received a complete description? Um, I have not received anything as of yet from Briarcliff Manor, no. Um, and I, I, yeah, I haven't received anything from them yet. Okay. Do they are they aware that technically they can't take action without giving us a complete description and then waiting 30 days? Um, I would believe so. Um, Why don't we remind them? Okay, I can do that. Okay, my second is on the North Castle Business Drive proposal. Now that the main development came before us, we sent a letter that was about as negative as could be considering they were building in the wetlands and now they are proposing 
to stockpile soil on the site before they even got approval of the site plan for the actual building. Um, we said we have no objection to them being lead agency, but uh, uh, I think we have to make sure that that doesn't go ahead uh, without them notifying us. Right, Richard, this is Holly. I'm, I will make a point to reach out to them this week and um, try to understand, you know, their, why they're moving forward, allowing this to move forward because um, we all agree this, not sh this is not a good project. Right, I mean, they obviously, like Mount Pleasant, can go ahead with it, but they have to file, you know, they have to go through certain procedures. And uh, if they're planning this stockpile, they must, must have, have to get some approvals uh, in order to do that. Okay, any other comments on the referrals? Yes, I just have one. It's really a question on the North Salem uh, horse barn expansion. Does this concern we noted about the watershed include groundwater protection? I notice it, it talks about runoff and so forth, but I'm also concerned just simply about the horse manure and the groundwater since it is in the watershed. Um, I know that the comments uh, generally a stock comment that we use because it's in the watershed um, and they have to go through the state or for through the city to kind of um, make sure that the water is protected. Um, I don't know offhand if that is um, including groundwater, but that's something that I can um, ask or Lucas will probably know, but um, I can I can definitely ask. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on the referrals? Okay, there being no further, can we have a motion to adopt them with Bernie uh, recusing from the Greenberg and the comments made uh, by the members? No move. Okay. That was, who moved it? Uh, this is Dwight, I'll move it. Thank you, Dwight, can we have a second? Yeah. Oh, James, I'll second it. Thank you. Can we call the parole bill? Sure. James Arndt? Yep. Good. Yes. Robert Barron? Aye. Dwight Douglas? Yes. Daniel Finger? Yes. Jimena Franchella? Yes. Gail for Hugh Grecian? Yes. Holly Hasbrook? Uh, yes. I'm in favor of everything except the North Castle project. Richard Hyman? Same. I'm in favor of everything except the North Coast. Vincent Kopicki? Yes. Kathy O'Connor? Yes. Bernie Tomes? Is the recuse? Thank you. And uh, Rini Toback? Yes. Great. Thank you. Hey, thank you, everyone. Uh, now matters for board action, the draft planning board report 2021 capital project request. Uh, Bill Brady is going to handle that. We've gotten several uh, additions and revisions to the original report, and Bill is going to go through uh, those changes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, as Richard said, we received comments uh, as we requested for June 23rd. Uh, and then we received some additional comments. I'll try to point out those additional comments that are reflected in the materials that you had uh, received yesterday. Uh, the first one, which is again a recent, a recent item, is that uh, uh, we requested to put in uh, a little bit more language on uh, how DPWT gets us some bridge condition rating and pavement condition index uh, information. Uh, the uh, DPWT uh, uh, reflects uh, the, uh, those condition ratings that often are several years old, uh, they often uh, supplement that with more recent DPWT inspections and uh, the uh, comment in there requests that they uh, provide that additional information to help better reflect the need and the priority of these projects. Um, a comment that, was, uh, that you saw in the, in the uh, materials last week regarding parking lot and garage recommendations, they're more significant uh, recommendations, there's a list of them, I won't go too much detail, but uh, as departments request new or rehabilitated uh, parking lots or garages, 
Uh, the comments suggest that, the, that they look into transportation demand management plans for such facilities, uh, looking at intelligent parking systems where sensors are installed at every parking space to show occupancy. Uh, it suggests carpool support systems uh, to uh, encourage uh, carpooling, uh, pricing parking to uh, disincentivize driving, bicycle and mo micro-mobility parking so that uh, other, uh, use, other ty types of transportation can be uh, provided at these facilities, bicycle rider support such as shower sinks and lockers, bicycle and micro-mobility systems, uh, particularly when you're planning uh, county campuses and other facilities, you consider bicycle and micro-mobility systems. Uh, recommendation on coordinating with uh, transit, uh, not only with our county uh, transportation planners, but also uh, for Beeline, but also MTA and uh, any other transit providers. Consider those when planning for park garages or parking lots. Also coordination, coordination with trailway managers, such as our county park system, uh, to encourage uh, employees to utilize those trailways uh, to get to and from work at any kind of parking garages or lots. And then finally, uh, considering parking lot reuse plans. So as departments are requesting funding for the parking lots or garages that they also consider if there's a reduction in uh, future demand, what could be uh, how those parking lots can be uh, reutilized. Uh, another comment that was in last year, additional comments were put in in your mailing last week regarding vehicle purchase recommendations. Uh, uh, a new comment was that the uh, uh, purchase of vehicles uh, being con consult with the National Association of C City Transportation Officials, or NACTO, and there was a link provided to NACTO. Also another link to New York City DOT's Clean Trucks Initiative. Um, also uh, another re reminder about uh, avoiding purchasing add-ons to vehicles like bull bars or emergency light fixtures, which are dangerous to not only the riders uh, of the vehicles, but also pedestrians and cyclists. Um, SUV purchases, uh, should be prohibited unless there's a well-documented justification for the use of SUVs, these larger vehicles. Bicycle and micro-mobility micro -mobility vehicles that uh, county departments, if it's appropriate, uh, consider using bicycles or e-bikes, uh, those types of vehicles uh, at county facilities, uh, particularly parks, uh, since uh, you know, they can use things like trails and, and within park systems to uh, uh, move around parks, uh, consider those vehicles. A new, uh, a new comment also is uh, focusing on the county's native plant species executive order, which requires that native plants uh, to Westchester County be exclusively uh, used at our county parks, public areas, gardens, roadsides, and other county properties, and then installation of plant species that are not, that are invasive are strictly prohibited. So that's new language we, got, we have in there. I'm gonna briefly go through just a few of the brief, some, most of them are brief changes we just wanted to point them out. BSS 17 on page 29, uh, the senior residential shelter facility at Valhalla. Uh, we found out that it's not only, for, it's a it's housed 19 bed shelter for homeless seniors with disabilities. It's, it's not only emergency transitional housing, but it also will be uh, uh, for permanent housing. So we specified that, that was something we found out. There were some substantial comments on page 57, RB04E Austin Avenue bridge over I-87. It's the rehabilitation of the bridge uh, that connects from the west. You've got Stu Leonard's and Costco, uh, and then that small bridge, that bridge over I-87 is gonna be rehabilitated. That's a county bridge. Uh, the road network around it, it's not county roads, but on the other side, we've also got the county's uh, material recovery facility or the MRF, uh, and also nearby is the big Ridge Hill development, the commercial and residential development that's still expanding. Uh, so. The comments focus on not only the bridge rehab and considering pedestrian and cycle safety, but then it also recommends that the county work with the city of Yonkers and New York State DOT to uh, make uh, area-wide improvements to help improve pedestrian and bicycle safety in that area. So uh, those are some new substantial comments on that. Um, I'm gonna jump to just a small change in RB220, Woods Road, Hammond House, and Sunshine Cottage Road, those are roads a road repaving uh, um, at Valhalla campus at Grasslands. We just uh, clarified the extent of the road work on Woods Road. Uh, it's the full length of the road that goes from uh, Grasslands Road up to Hospital Road. So we just made that edit. Uh, RGC 12 Dunwoody Golf Course. Um, we luckily uh, found out that the work that was in our original planning board report, uh, we had to change that 
uh, we had originally said that the work for 2021 was for parking lot improvements. Uh, that work had already been done years ago. The 2021 funds are for additional uh, funds for design and construction for the uh, new maintenance facility at Dunwoody. So we've reflected that in the planning board report. And again, our comments state to, uh, uh, that the planning department will be um, uh, reviewing those projects. Um, we, oh, before I forget too, I'm sorry, we also had uh, cross-referenced any project where the county has a, a project rating, a planning board rating that has an HP or historic preservation. Uh, we expanded that to make sure that all the planning board reports for projects that are HP or historic preservation projects, we uh, made sure that we had uh, language in there saying that the county's historic preservation advisory committee or HPAC uh, will be notified and we'll have the opportunity to review those projects. Uh, again, go, moving forward, I'm going to jump to AO42C, Stormwater Management Program at the airport. Uh, the chairman had a question on how this project is all county funds, whereas uh, airport projects uh, typically have non-county share funds, um, uh, which are usually from FAA. Uh, we got in touch with uh, DPWT. They said that this project, it's, yes, it has no FAA funds. There were no funds available for this project uh, from FAA. Uh, but then also we wanted to specify how that the county share funds, the $8.7 million in 2021 for this project, which is uh, basin work, uh, stormwater basins, those 2021 funds, the county share is actually from the airport special revenue funds. So uh, whereas the, the chairman just wanted to specify that uh, uh, while it says county funds, these are not tax levy funds. These are funds that are raised by the airport special revenue funds through the uh, user fees at the airport. And then finally, uh, page 119, SPS 08, North Yonkers Pump Station Mage, main surge chamber. Uh, we had an error in our report that the um, design is anticipated to be completed in 2019. Uh, in fact, since it's 2021, that's, uh, the design is anticipated to be completed in 2021. So we ma we've made that correction as well. Um, so. Uh, I'll pause for any comments or uh, further edits or questions, uh, but we also have a resolution uh, that was uh, provided last week uh, for the board to support the, the, uh, the planning board report that would be, after, again, after any further edits uh, that we can incorporate would be forwarded along to the county executive and the capital projects committee. Anyone have any additional comments on the capital project? I just want to add one other thing, which we discussed before, that it's important that the amount that's listed as expended and obligated in the long sheets be updated continually so that there is a clear understanding of how much money is actually available. Uh, we can see from both the Housing Implementation Fund and New Home Land Acquisition lines that it shows that there's more money available that's been appropriated but neither expended nor obligated uh, than there really is. And therefore, we need to have a better definition of what is obligated. Is it obligated when the Board of Legislators authorize a bond? Is it obligated when the bond goes out? Uh, is it obligated when the bond is sold? And so we need a better clarification of what it means to be obligated. Right. Th thank you, Richard. Yeah, we're, we've met uh, since our last meeting, we've met with our budget office and we're going to be working with our finance department to ensure that that, that step is um, more clearly understood and, and the system so that it's reflected in the sheets that we don't have this huge gap, as you pointed out. And uh, so we'll be working with budget and finance to get that fixed. Okay, are there any other comments? If not, can I have a motion to approve the resolution in your package, uh, adoption of the planning board report on the 2021 capital project request? This is Dwight, so moved. Thank you, Dwight. Can I have a second? Daniel Finger, second. Thank you, Daniel. Bill, call the roll, please. Uh, James Arndt. Yes. Robert Barron. Yes. Dwight Douglas. Yes. Daniel Finger. Yes. Jimena Franchella. Jimena? Yes. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Gail for Hugh Gretchen. Yes. Holly Hasbrook. Yes. Richard Hyman. Yes. Vincent Kopicki. Yes. Kathy O'Connor. Yes. Bernie Tomes. Yes. And Rini Toback. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next item. Wait, Richard. Yes. Richard. Yeah. Before, before we move on, I just want to ask in terms of follow up to this document. Um, I, I think it's important. There's a lot of stuff in here that we figure out a way to um, like I get an understanding of how this is being operationalized in the same way you're sort of, you know, you want the, the numbers to be um, you know, updated continually. It, it would be good to figure out how these recommendations are being sort of, you know, um, uh, departments are being instituted, you know, and that like, and, and some kind of feedback loop back to us so that we could see like, okay, yes, we put this in here. Yes, here, here's how it's being, you know, it's playing out. Okay, it has to go through many levels of before it's finally adopted. Uh, it has to go through special committee, board of legislators, the county executive. So when it's when the final adoption comes through, perhaps we can get a report as to uh, if there were changes made, uh, adjustments made, and then uh, maybe even a mid-year update. Do you think that would be possible, Norma? Uh, yes. I mean, the next step for this is for the Capital Projects Committee to meet on it. Um, and then ultimately, it goes to the Board of Legislators, you know, by the county executive. So there could be some additional changes just by the county executive himself. And then before the end of the year, the Board of Legislators will adopt it. And as we know, they make their own changes to it. So we do give you an update, um, you know, whenever we can. We don't necessarily always know. We may not know really anything between now and when it gets submitted to the Board of Legislators in um, October. Okay. Okay, thank you, Norma. Okay, next item on the agenda. Thank you. SY031, Sewer System Consolidation Feasibility Study, CBA. The presentation by Michael Kaplowitz, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Environmental Facilities. Michael, are you there? Michael, if you're there, can you unmute yourself? Michael, you may also have to unmute yourself on the on the screen, uh, the red unmute button. The little microphone red button, you may have to hit that as well. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. Do we see Michael on the screen anymore? I He was on before. Now I don't see him on the... Is yeah, he's still on there. And okay. he shows that it's, he's unmuted, so. Okay, yeah, I don't see any mute button there. Um, yeah, it shows unmuted. And he had his uh, video on before as well. But now there's no video, right? No, the, it's there. The video is, is there. Okay. I mean, the, the, uh, it's on the screen. Right. There's no picture of him, though. Right. There was a picture before. Now there's yeah. no pictures. Yeah. I'm concerned that maybe he lost us or something. Um, Why don't we go to the next item and come back to this? Sure. Okay. BPL 40 stormwater management, various locations, Maiden Lane Dam removal, town of Cortland. David is going to take this. Yes. Uh, good morning. Um, I, these uh, before the planning board right now are two resolutions for capital budget amendments to the big capital project BPL 40. We're doing these capital budget amendments not to add any money to the project. There is enough money in the capital budget right or in the capital project right now, but we need to add these two locations uh, to the capital project. So that's the reason for the CBAs. The first project is the removal of the Maiden Lane Dam 
which is I don't know if I don't know if you can see my pointer. Yeah, yeah I think you I think it's working out there. Yeah. yeah so that's right. the the red circle to the right on the screen here is the uh the maiden lane dam. The red circle to the left, um a little bit more east and closer to the Hudson River, uh was a smaller dam. Actually it had breached uh naturally uh and was removed um maybe a year or two ago um through, by the parks department uh with uh with some grant funding and do and they did some little stream restoration there. So these two dams represent um significant fish passage obstructions. Uh this is along Furnace Brook within Oscawana Park, which is located in the town of Cortland. Uh, and if we can go to the next slide, we'll get a little bit zoom while we're going to zoom to the right here. So now the Maiden Lane Dam is over here to the left on the red circle. And you can see Route 9A down the center of the screen there, and then uh, Albany Post Road that runs alongside uh, Furnace Brook Road um, is, to the, is to the south. You can see the large impoundment of the water here. Um, behind Maiden Lane Dam. This project will remove that dam, restore the stream and the associated floodplain to improve fish passage. Uh, it will also alleviate some localized flooding uh, in the areas um, uh, in, in this immediate area. There are additional obstructions just up, up, you know, just upstream. There's a culvert that under 9A and then another dam uh, over to the right here. They, were, they are not part of this project. We're really focusing just on this uh, main lane dam here. The design, conceptual design has already been done. It was prepared by um, Riverkeeper with some grant funding that they received. Uh, so we're looking for some capital money to move this project forward. Uh, Riverkeeper was not successful in re receiving any grant awards for removal of the dam. Uh, it's not that expensive a project. Uh, we're thinking it's about a million and a half dollars we're budgeting for the entire project plus um, soft costs to do bid uh, construction documents and bid specs. Um, and that is basically it for this project. Well, the next David, project. David, yes. David, why was the dam put there in the first place? The dam was originally put there in the first place for, uh, I think it was for flood retention. Um, they had, there's a, if you, well, if we zoomed out along Furnace Brook here, you'll see a large number of dams all along Furnace, Furnace Brook that have small impoundments behind them. This is one of the smallest. Uh, but to the right here, this is a relatively large, um, excuse me, pond. And then upstream, there are a couple of larger ponds as well. So. Uh, this this will start to improve fish passage up uh, uh, up the stream, particularly in Oscawana Park, which would which will provide um, some really good habitat for some for some spawning species. Okay, go ahead. The next location, so this is another project, is right off of Edith Reed Wildlife Sanctuary, which is adjacent to Playland. Here's Play, Playland to the left here and the Edith Reed Wildlife Sanctuary is to the right. Um, this large lake here is Minersing Lake. Uh, about, oh gosh, almost 10 years ago now, about eight years ago, we, um, uh, no, it was about 10 years ago. We had a ribbon cutting in 2011, 2012. Uh, we, uh, th with a, a number of different funding sources, uh, the county through its Soil and Water Conservation District restored a tidal wetland along this entirety of the, the lake. We also restored or re reconstructed a tide gate, a self-regulating tide gate that runs under the the, um, the access road here that goes to Edith Reed Sanctuary. Uh, we're in the process right now, DPW is in the process right now of um, rebuilding, or actually just finished rebuilding that, uh, that tide gate. We had some issues with it. Uh, so that's functioning again, and we will be, um, uh, that regulates the tide in the lake to uh, improve the wetland. The project, this, pro this project, however, is focused more on the coastal area. Uh, this red line here shows an area that we're proposing to do a living shoreline project. Uh, we're just in the process of uh, finishing up a design report uh, for that. So it's a really kind of a conceptual design report uh, for uh, the benefits of a living shoreline here, um, a slash artificial reef uh, to do uh, that will provide some protection against coastal storms uh, for the shoreline, so, so protect against some erosion problems, and it will also provide additional marine habitat uh, in that area. If we go to the next slide, I have some photos or some images from 
uh, that report. I don't know if you can zoom in here or not, but you can kind of see. Uh, we'll make this a report available. Again, we're we're just uh, reviewing it right now, but we'll make this report available um, uh, at, when it's completed, probably by the end of the month uh, or so. The um, so this is uh, this just shows some of the wave action that happens here and some of the different types of tidal action uh, that impact erosion. We used to have a beach dune out here. Uh, that was um, destroyed basically a couple of times. We, re we restored it um, with some grant funding from the DEC uh, twice, and uh, and it was taken down by storms. A lot, the most recent, um, the Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Um, the the project will address these issues. If you go to the next, using uh, go to the next slide, we can, we'll have some images of. Um, so this is basically the the concept for a living shoreline. We'll be creating an artificial reef or breakwater here, which will which will protect against wave action and then also create some habitat in here. It also provides areas for sediment to drop out and tidal wetlands to form. So that's one of the issues that uh, we have in Westchester, in the Long Island Sound and along, and more, more importantly, along the Hudson River, is there's very few areas for uh, tidal wetlands to migrate. So as sea level rises, it kind of floods out the tidelands, ti uh, the, uh, the tidal wetlands. This will allow for additional area for area, you know, for tidal wetlands to start to form. Uh, this is a, a photograph of a, uh, a similar project, this was done by the same consultant. This was up in Stratford, Connecticut, uh, using reef balls. I don't know if, if you're familiar with the artificial reefs. Um, this is a pretty common uh, construction method to do that, and it does provide. So they're basically big, they look like big wiffle balls, but they're made out of concrete. So they are heavy, uh, but fish can swim through and provides a variety of habitat for, uh, for marine life. And I think on the last slide has another image of a different type of uh, yeah, this is a different um, a different example of a different method to do some breakwaters uh, and provide some additional habitat. And you can see how the sand will build up right behind these things. So, um, so we're looking forward to it. It'll it'll be the first artificial reef um, in Westchester County, and uh, it is being used a lot as a tool for um, coastal. Storm surge uh, and uh, and protection and, and um, erosion control, and um, in Long Island and uh, and New York City. So we're we're ho hopeful to uh, that it'll work here, and that we'll have a successful project. So that's another approximately a million and a half dollars for design and construction out of BPL 40. Now, David, you said oh, so the money is already in. You're just allocating the money that's there to these two the projects. Exactly. Exactly. Does anyone have any questions on this on these two? Yeah. Is can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, is is the Minersing Lake is that a natural lake or is that something that was created? No, Minersing Lake was it is a created lake, but um, it it was it used to be tidal. You know, the spit the the spit was there, and uh, and it was connected and and you know, kind of cut off to form a lake, but it is a tidal lake. Uh, the tide gate regulates uh, the amount of water that, that flushes in and out of that lake. So it does get some tidal action. Uh, and um, yeah, you can see here, this whole area was, was added on, um, you know, it used to be more open to the sound. And, uh, but it, and it does, as a, as a tidal lake, it does provide some pretty unique uh, habitat for waterfowl, for bird species. Um, and is a, and is in, it's considered an important bird area uh, by the the, um, uh, the Audubon Society. And is there like an interpretive signage plan to explain all this? Yeah, we typically do interpretive signage when we do these projects. We did, and we will work closely with the uh, the wildlife sanctuary and the naturalists there in the parks department. They're they're they've been really great at um, promoting the project and using the project as a demonstration and education tool for the visitors to the park. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Can you tell me how the um dollars that's already in the budget was labeled for this? We, the BPL 40, uh, similar to BPL 26, they're, these are regular, they're, they're 
so I wouldn't say really unique projects, but we do this every now and then with projects that we have for specific reasons, but not necessarily specific projects. So this is a project, BPL-40 is a general project for stormwater management and, um, and flood control at various county facilities. So uh, what we do is once, when we have a project identified, we will come back and add that into the cap, we're using a capital budget amendment, we will add that project uh, to the to the capital projects so that we can construct it. Um, we typically, for these projects, we typically look for grant funding, um, and we have looked for grant funding for both of these. Uh, we've got some monies for, some small monies for design um, for both, uh, but not the construction funds. We, we've been successful in getting uh, construction grants um, for both of these projects. We did apply for both uh, in the, within the past couple of years. Either us or the Riverkeeper, like I said, Riverkeeper applied for that Furnace Brook Dam removal, um, and uh, and we did apply through the Long Island Sound study for a, uh, a, to, a construction funding for this project, but we were not awarded that. Any other questions? Yeah, no, I just want to say thanks for that, and I'm really happy to see us moving beyond the uh, stormwater management system of putting retaining walls and other such thing. I think this is a good good project. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions? <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, are there separate resolutions for these two? There are, yes. Okay. So, can I get a motion on the first uh, Maiden Lane Dam removal project? So moved. This is Dwight. Thank you, Dwight. Can I have a second? Yes, this is Rini. Bill, call the roll. James Arndt. Yes. Robert Barron. Aye. Dwight Douglas. Aye. Daniel Finger. Yes. Jimena Franchella. Yes. Gail for you, Grechen. Yes. Holly Hasbro. Yes. Richard Hyman. Yes. Vincent Kopicki. Yes. Kathy O'Connor. Yes. Bernie Tomes. Yes. And Rini Toback. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a motion on the second, the um, artificial reef project? So I moved. So moved. I, I'm sorry. So moved. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. Second, please. I'll second, Holly. Thank you, Holly. Bill, please call the roll. James Arndt. Yes. Robert Barron. Aye. Dwight Douglas. Aye. Daniel Finger. Yes. Jimena Franchella. Yes. Gail for you, Grechen. Yes. Holly Hasbro. Yes. Richard Hyman. Yes. Vincent Kopicki. Yes. Kathy O'Connor. Yes. Bernie Tomes. Yes. And Rini Toback. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let's see if we can go back to SY031. Do we have Michael Kaplowitz? Testing, testing. Can everybody hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Thank you. People have been, uh, the legislator, trying to shut me up for years. I think they finally accomplished it. And um, technologically, we figured how to get me back on. So uh, thank you for your patience. Sewer consolidation has taken uh, since the 1980s. So I guess a little bit longer isn't, isn't so bad. But um, in the late, uh, late part of December this past year, the county executive um, asked me to head up the, um, the Westchester County sewer consolidation effort. Um, since then, uh, thanks to him and uh, to Director of Operations, Joan McDonald, to our Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins, uh, particularly thanks to uh, Commissioner Kapicki and Deputy Commissioner Federici at uh, Department of Environmental Facilities and uh, Norma Drummond, uh, all of which uh, have been very, very helpful in trying to get me up to speed on this issue and to, to bring us to, uh, to today, which I, I think is a very exciting opportunity, particularly given the timing given the fact that there is so much negativity and, and, and obviously the, the negative impact of, of the pandemic, um, it's a, 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 interestingly a good time to do some long range planning um, and particularly where we're trying to create efficiencies and potentially save money 
in a world where there aren't too many of those savings opportunities, I think this is a particularly timely project. So here we are uh, in the draft form. Uh, Mike, next slide. So the goals of sewer consolidation then would be first and foremost to ultimately save a taxpayer money, to realize operational efficiencies, to reduce cost of capital projects through economies of scale, to improve our environmental footprint, reduce some operational difficulties that uh, potentially creep up, and then interface with the regulatory agencies on a more effective basis. Next slide. The county board does have broad authority. See Todd Miles in, in 1987. This is a quote from him saying, we do have the opportunity uh, to consolidate illegally. Secondly, um, report from 2003, which lauded uh, then County Executive Andy Spano on a um, a consolidated basis doing I and I work and saving ultimately some significant savings for uh, um, individuals in the, the applicable uh, Long Island districts. Next slide. Our quote from George Latimer, can executive every promise a solution, every challenge is surmountable. As I said, this one has been around since the 1980s, if not sooner, um, and trying to come up with a solution to this vexing issue. Uh, and then finally, a conversation I had with uh, a former DEF commissioner, Tom Laurel, back in um, late February and early March, in viewing this, he had uh, used this line. I asked if he, I could quote him from it. Uh, I think a well-executed consolidation plan would be good for the county in its future. And given um, his uh, unfortunate and far too early um, demise um, and, and the loss to the pandemic, I think this is a, a very apt uh, tribute to him and all the great work that he has done through the years. And a great legacy would be able to uh, figure out a way to move forward with this consolidation study. Next slide. So, so what we have at this point from, from a homeowner through uh, the county treatment plants, uh, the homeowner uh, generates um, the, uh, the sewage. It runs through their lateral to the uh, middle of the street, if you will, where it picks up um, a municipal lateral the municipal lateral flows to a county a junction, to a manhole, to a county main. Uh, there are pumping stations where appropriate through the county mains and ultimately to one of seven wastewater resource recovery facilities, AKA sewage treatment plants. There are 13 county districts, uh, 12 created by the county. And historically, the first district, the Bronx Valley was actually created uh, by the state legislature. And of course, the Yonkers plant is the largest, three on the Hudson and four on Long Island Sound. What all county um, sewer district consolidation efforts up till now have been relate to taking the 13 county sewer districts and the seven sewage treatment plants and putting them into one enhanced Department of Environmental Facilities and running it as a single entity. For a number of years now, of course, we have attributed costs of operations um, on a, a proportionate basis, an ad valorem basis to each of the districts, but the capital expenses remain discrete to each of the districts and their applicable costs. So next slide, if you could, please. That's the big picture. Why consolidate then? The, the reason to consolidate and the effort all along has been that if you take a, a home, for example, in Pelham, Ben Akilson study showed, depending on which sewer district they were in, uh, a Pelham resident, one part of uh, the municipality would, would have paid $225, and another resident in the same municipality would have paid $323, simply depending on the sewer district. It made no sense. Consolidation of county districts would theoretically create then a single cost for uh, each of the residents in each of municipalities. We would be an opportunity to share significant future capital costs, in one district with all county parcels, and you could do I and I best on a regional basis, infiltration and inflow, and you would have possible future capital cost savings with larger projects garnering cost savings through economies of scale. Next slide. However, why not to consolidate the county only? And this is what it's run into this effort for the last 40 some odd years. There are really no actual savings to be achieved achieved since all operations and maintenance costs are already apportioned and therefore consolidated. Of course, capital costs are not consolidated. Purchasing, for example, and, and personnel costs are already handled on a consolidated basis. And there's a political and legislative difficulty of achieving consensus and approval when some communities would financially benefit, some communities would go down in cost. And so finally, achieving con county consolidation up till now has been a zero-sum exercise. It's the same exact cost. We're just moving the chairs around on the deck of the uh, 
of the Titanic, if you will, and some districts would pay more, some would pay less, but there wouldn't be any different service and no legislative body, no county executive would support a situation where costs would simply go up magically for some and down for others. Appendix A, which you'll have in your handouts, you'll see is an example of a Ben Kielsen study showing just that. So we've never consolidated because there's never been a consensus, never been a consensus because there's never really a reason just to consolidate county only. Next slide. However, there is really an opportunity on a comprehensive basis to move to an enhanced option. So the first option we spoke about, A, is the county only. It just doesn't make any sense. And there's just, just no, no benefits and too much political and, and legislative and legal difficulties. B, however, is very much in play. The scenario B is take the 13 districts, the seven wastewater resource recovery facilities, and all municipal sewer service and put that into one consolidated sewer district. You remember the map of the homeowner to the municipality, to the county main, to the county sewage treatment plant. What if this consolidated district picked up everything from where the homeowner lateral went into the middle of the street? Think of one enhanced environmental facilities department that would be the entire sewer service for all of Westchester County. No municipality theoretically would then have sewer service, no DPW sewer department. It would all be run by a county consolidated environmental facilities. By doing this comprehensive consolidation, all operation and maintenance, all capital would then be directly attributed to this one district, and you would relieve taxpayers and municipalities of sewer expense. You would achieve ultimate savings through eventual attrition of personnel, reduced management duplication, and a real opportunity for significant capital savings due to larger contracts and economies of scale, improved oversight, greater infrastructure investment within this consolidated district versus this current patchwork of uneven municipal capital investment and maintenance leading to greater operational and environmental benefits. Finally, you'd have the responsibility for system maintenance given to the same organization that benefits from proper maintenance of the system, that is Westchester County. Parenthetically, think of schools, 40 some odd districts, think of fire districts, 48 fire districts or over 50 districts. Wouldn't it be nice if there was one fire district, one school district? Well, above ground, we have difficulty doing that because of the ownership, the proprietary nature. You don't have that proprietary nature of below ground sewer service, and consequently you have this opportunity. Now, C would then be the same county districts, the same wastewater, and some municipal sewer district. This is very important. In researching, for example, Nassau County and what they did on a best practices basis, not all municipalities have joined into the consolidated district. So the question would be, does it stop it, the effort, if one of the district out of the 42 choose not to join? The Nassau County and other experiences show, no, that would not be the case. We could still go forward with a consolidated effort and communities on a carrot basis could join if they choose, but if they choose for whatever reason not to, it would not stop it up. Instead, those non-joining communities would utilize the service via IMAs that the district would reach with these various communities. So that was a very important point. Finally, a creation of a county sewer and stormwater authority by the New York State Legislative Action is a possibility. If we consolidate, do we do it as an enhanced Department of Environmental Facilities, or we do it as an authority? This consulting study, this SY031, very critical action would be to study whether there are any benefits of one versus the other, but either of those two would still allow for consolidation. And finally, there's a lot of PPP or public-private partnership um, Efforts that are out there, Nassau County turned to Suez, for example, Long Island, other entities have. Do we want to engage in this? We're not at that point yet. We need to do this sewer consolidation feasibility study and invite PPPs if they choose to participate and, and show that, in fact, they can play a role here. Perhaps they can't. There's very strong emotion on both sides, but ultimately we need to let best science rule and, and this, the consolidation feasibility study would, would indicate to us whether there might be a role or not. Uh, the, the, certainly the, the consolidation study does not go in with a particular premise, though, though the DEF, um, as I've seen in the last six months, does a phenomenal job in, in discharging the service. And, and there's every reason to believe that either through an authority or consolidated district, that you can continue as a direct governmental action. Additional considerations of nonprofits in many of the the municipalities, nonprofits think hospitals, 
think colleges, universities utilize the county sewer service and municipal service, but only pay the county sewer service, not the municipal tax. So for example, New Rochelle has, has told us that as much as 30% of the sewer service in New Rochelle is nonprofit and they're not paying New Rochelle sewer tax. This would be an opportunity under this consolidated world to be able to bring in fairly those that generate the sewer would then would be able to, would be forced to then pay the sewer cost. And this would provide a benefit to homeowners ultimately. Second, and this is the Norma Drummond point, a very important point from a planning consideration. If we move to a consolidated district, municipal development considerations within a consolidated system are necessary regarding future flow. See enforcement authority over illegal connections as well. Think of a community that, that is in now a consolidated district and wants to lay on a million, two million, three million square feet of additional use. Um, through development. That's great, but the county in a consolidated world should have some say or at least some oversight or some role of this study to then determine how that role appropriately flows. Some role because this would then affect every other community within the consolidated sewer district. So an important additional consideration. There, there's a sense not to do on the number three stormwater collection as part of this um, study. And certainly the study will not have it and not even moving forward. However, um, this is something we're going to need to face up with at some point. Remember that Yonkers does have a a dual collection, a consolidated uh, collection system. They have a combined sewer and stormwater. So that would be part of a consolidated sewer district, but the stormwater component would be a, a future com consideration. Phase in over time to minimize short-term disruptions. Every community that's consolidated, a number of them in the, in the state are looking to consolidate or have already. They've all used time to uh, ameliorate some of the, the initial negative disruptions, uh, read high tax disruptions, so time would be an important consideration. And then finally, very important, number five. So the mayor of White Plains said to me at one point, why should we join a sewer district? We have improved our and invested in our city sewer system. We're not going to join them with a community that hasn't done it yet. We would be paying for their service. That's fair. So number five says that when you join up with consolidation, you, your municipality would have to invest 100% in all sewer infrastructure needed preparatory to joining or the consolidated district could contract on potentially a lower cost basis using economy of scale and do work in many municipalities with the cost attributed back to the municipality to allow them to join in at that particular point. But number five is an equity and fairness issue that needs to be very front lobe for each of us. Next page, please. County sewer uh, personnel uh, needs to be um, cognizant of that there are many different unions, and this is not an effort to um, get rid of unions, nor an effort to uh, fire people or uh, put people out of work. Everyone will will keep their job, whether they were working municipality, municipally or come over to the county. But we do have over time, and Nassau had used that in other communities as well, an attrition when people do, however, retire, you have an opportunity at that point, not necessarily to then rehire, because remember, you'll have a good commissioner compete who will be able to manage each of these individuals on a, um, a mutual aid basis, if you will, and be able to send people on a, an efficient basis all throughout the consolidated district. Number seven is very important, very real capital savings potential. Talk to Larchmont, and they saved approximately 30% on one sewer maintenance contract alone through their consortium of New Rochelle and Larchmont and Pella Manor and Mamaronic. And let's all remember the BNR nitrogen removal contract, the biologic um, nutrient removal, saved taxpayers over $230 million when, in fact, we did it on a bubble consolidated basis. Number seven is really the key here to why this consolidated district can theoretically save quite a bit of money for taxpayers savings that we very much need to see given what's happening in the world. Legal considerations number eight are very important. Um, uh, John Nona, uh, the county attorney has put out, has a memo. You'll see that in your appendix. Uh, it is very doable, though there are issues that we're gonna have to deal with on the consolidated 
district basis. Number nine, I touched before, if municipalities refuse, we would go through an IMA. Number 10, I believe real practical and financial pressure would be on refusing communities when they see participating communities saving on maintenance and future capital costs within the world of eventual tax cap. But we're doing it as a carrot, not a stick. This SYO 31 again would, would lay out these various considerations. Number 11, leaving the septic areas out for future consideration. This is a sewer consolidation study. Number 12, to be looked at by the study, do we tax or charge based on water usage versus assessed value? Currently, we're using assessed value, and beyond the scope of this presentation, there are issues of fairness that we that the study will get into. 13, these are some studies that will, are um, some, excuse me, assets available that will allow the consolidated study to be able to, consolidated, excuse me, district to kick in. Number 14, uh, Dolph Rothfeld, for what it's worth, um, and it's worth quite a bit in my mind, has endorsed this project. He was also the one that indicated we should focus on um, and, and really leave, leave the stormwater for future discussions. Number 15, uh, you'll see in your appendix as well, just dealing with other municipalities throughout the state, a NISAC memo. Number 16, dealing with authorities, you'll see it in your appendix. Number 17, save the sound comments um, from a July 18 memo. Again, you'll see it under appendix. And then 18, the law department could explore whether we want to do a stick versus a carrot. Um, but but nonetheless, I think we're going into this with a, a carrot and a sweetener process rather than a mandate that you must join the consolidated district. So this is I and I for those that are less informed. You can look at this later on, but this is the famous inflow and infiltration and where the water comes from and how it gets into our stormwater and then, excuse me, into our sewer uh, system and then we, where we need to then treat um, infiltration and inflow on a very costly basis um, at our seven wastewater resource recovery facilities. Next slide. I and I, this sets it out. I asked DEF staff, they, depending on the rainfall, came up with a, an estimate of, of anywhere between a million and $16.5 million additional on an annual basis using real rainfall amounts over the last few years. And this is on top of all other costs. Um, it is directly attributable to and correlates with rainwater, but there is a real cost to having I and I from a financial standpoint. There's also an environmental cost there's um, under number two, and you can read the Save the Sound email that really sums that up very nicely. Um, we have house connection options, options with potential county uh, wide law. We can mandate that, that municipalities go to everyone's home, and in fact, you have to. Or Pipe Logic, the next one is a company, and there are others out there. I'm not pushing this company for sure, but this is a company that we need, you need to just Google. It's very interesting. They actually have contracted out on Long Island where they inspect and repair private homeowner laterals where the homeowners pay on a set level basis. And if your home doesn't need lateral repair or inspection, you pay a small amount. If you do, however, need the work, that small amount covers the cost of a significant cost. It then would allow us to extend this consolidated district's effectiveness into the home, and it would be a true soup to nuts bad analogy, I guess, given the, the, the topic we're at to, but give from generation through wastewater resource recovery facility an opportunity to really do a, a wonderful job of treating I and I at the beginning, and then of course the, the effluent at the end. So this is something that the study will, will look at. Exfiltration is a big problem. What I've learned is as much as 25% of environmental I and I problems of bad material, raw and treated material getting into our, our wastewater, into our, um, excuse me, our, our water bodies is exfiltration, material coming out of the pipe and then leaking out and then washing into the Hudson River or the Long Island Sound or our reservoirs, this would also potentially get to the exfiltration problem. And then you have future climate changes potentially out there, rising groundwater, operational impacts. I and I is a problem and will be a, a bigger problem as time goes on. Here we have through SYO 31 a chance to get to it. Mount Vernon sewer situation. Uh, the, the, certainly the pandemic has put a stop on many of the, the opportunities to meet with, but by all accounts, um, the there's this is a, a significant problem for this particular municipality um, and an underinvestment, if you will, uh, in the infrastructure um, of sewage uh, and sewer infrastructure. There needs to be a comprehensive assessment and some significant financial investment. Um, and SYO 31 is going to go through that. Um, there's a possible state funding opportunities. Um, shared service awards, EFC, that I know my department has, uh, uh, Commissioner Kupiki's department has been in touch with, um, EFC on this. 
water for um, infrastructure improvement acts and other grants. So we're hoping both to the study and to the future work that's needed for those communities to come up to speed. There are potential state funding opportunities. Everyone is moving in the same direction. Consolidation is the way to go. Onondaga is doing it, and we have a chance as Westchester to tap into some of these funding opportunities. Sewer authority considerations. Again, the consolidation study will look at it. There are some benefits of, of an authority consideration, and, and that's something that needs to be looked at. Maybe on the other hand, there isn't, just because it sounds like a, a wonderful title. Uh, why do we need an authority when an enhanced DEF could do it? Or maybe we do set up an authority where the executive director of the authority is uh, currently the commissioner and would then become the executive director of the authority to be decided. Key stakeholders, um, this is going to take a lot of homework and a lot of work, and the county executive is, is expert in his entire administrative staff. I look forward to playing a, a role in this as well and rolling out um, information and a listening tour to all the municipalities. I've spoken to, um, uh, for example, uh, the Westchester County Association, uh, excuse me, the, the Westchester Municipal Officials uh, earlier in the year before the pandemic had hit um, and look forward to the opportunity to roll out to the municipalities, to elected officials, homeowners, nonprofits, applicable unions, businesses, environmental groups, and the the, um, the ABCs of regulatory agencies, um, the opportunity and the necessity of talking to everybody. Important at the bottom, we need to analyze for a homeowner, is this going to be a good thing or a bad thing? And first and foremost, they look at it from a financial standpoint. So we've written into this SYO 31 that we want in each community a study of what the impact would be to the average homeowner, a $500,000 house in each of the communities, for example. What would it be when you look at school tax, municipal tax, county tax? Are there going to be savings or is it, and, and costs will go down, or is the cost going to go up? And this is something that we're going to build in so that it'll be easier to sell, to convince, to be able to move this, roll this out. That's one of the things that also has stopped this up, the uncertainty and the fear. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to pay more. We've heard that a million times. I'm trying to head that off at the beginning. And this consolidation study, I'm asking them for the consultant for real numbers that we can be able to show and um, homeowners that this is nothing to fear. Instead, with economies of scale and nonprofits paying their fair share, you're actually going to see savings. Nassau County experience, again, memo, you'll see that Appendix 6. Um, they did some good things. They phased it in. They, they set up a sewer authority. However, some things that we, we don't think are applicable for us. This is a financing authority only. It's not an operational authority. So it created another level of bureaucracy without necessarily any operational benefit. That's not what we're looking for here. They also entered into a public-private partnership. They were hoping for big savings. The quote was, we think we can save $230 million over 20 years entering this PPP. When we spoke to Deputy Commissioner Federici and I spoke to Nassau, the quote was, we don't believe that's likely to be achieved. So we're very healthily skeptical towards it. And, and on the other hand, intellectually, this consolidation study will look at all the players across the board. So summary recommendation, SY031, asking for your support today and then moving it through the, the um, organs of, of county government and onto the board of legislators. I look forward to having a healthy discussion with, uh, with the legislature um, using with the county's uh, executive's assistance and support is the sewer system consolidation feasibility study, which would be designed and the conduct of this study of all municipal operations to uh, consolidate. That would be task two. And the subtlety here is, and an important point is task one, which is special consideration of the New Rochelle District Consortium Consolidation. The four aforementioned communities in the New Rochelle District are very supportive. You have a letter from them in support of, they are ready to go. We had done a task one um, through the Department of Environmental Facilities and the county a couple of years ago um, through Arcadis, and it showed that this is very doable, that we're up to the second part of how does it get done, how does it get phased, in how did the, the details all work and so what you're looking what we're looking for you to approve today is both task one and task two new rochelle specific and then use that for um uh the, the task two consideration because much of the work will have been studied through through task one the entire capital budget amendment request is for 1.6 million dollars and if in fact we move in this direction next slide we're hopeful that we can uh, achieve then through this study with potential grant opportunities uh, the first year to roll it out with the conducting the study and uh, a stakeholder listening tour and the second year then hoping to reach consensus and implement very important and final slide 
to goals that hopefully can be achieved. Uh, again, in this world, more necessary than ever, trying to save taxpayer money through efficiencies, reduce capital cost projects through these economies of scale. Why have a vacuum truck in every community? Why do uh, cleaning and lining of all pipes 42 times with 42 contracts? Why not do one contract for every community? Uh, improving the environmental footprint, there would be one um, environmental facilities department and or authority where all the regulatory agencies could show up and we could, instead of pointing fingers at everybody, which happens now because we have these split um, uh, uh, municipalities and, and split obligations, it would it would lie in one location. We could then have all operational um, necessities through one department and standardization. And then, as I indicated, the interface with regulatory agencies. This is very doable, very possible. It's languished for many, many years, not because it's not a good idea or not good people trying it. It's just I think the scale has been more limited than necessary. This is an opportunity to do it on a comprehensive basis. You'll see the appendix to follow. Thank you for your time and any questions. Thank you. Uh, anyone have any questions? Well, I'll start off. I have one. Uh, you're going to be taxing not nonprofits. Uh, I'm sure there are nonprofits that could afford out of their budgets to pay a tax, but I would think that there are some nonprofits could never afford to pay a tax. I don't know if housing authorities uh, pay tax now, but you know they're running tight budgets. I don't know how they could pay an additional amount. And I'm sure there are other nonprofits that would have a hard time paying a tax. So the the it's a fair point. Um, it, the, the window's closing as it is. The the many municipalities are moving towards a user fee, and and the user fee is going to cover that. So they're they're either going to get it through a user fee eventually, uh, or or direct tax. Um, remember, the homeowners are unfairly paying that. Secondly, they're using the sewer service. Third, they are paying county sewer tax. We found in all cases, haven't found a case where they are not paying sewer tax as it is to the county. So that's not an issue. It's an issue of, um, sh is it fair that Montefiore Hospital does not pay uh, the appropriate uh, cost of running the sewer system? And in, in many cases, they're going to need to factor in. And, and that's why phase in over a good period of time is going to be necessary. Education is going to be necessary. Uh, and, and this is going to be an adult conversation we're going to need to have. But in all fairness, it, it's kind of strange that, that, and remember, if you're a nonprofit in a building, you're already paying rent to the building. So, so your cost is not going to go up there, right? The, no, no. The, I'm so, talking about nonprofit owners. We're talking about discrete, discrete facilities that, that are out there. Um, they pay an electric bill. They pay other other costs of, of having that particular uh, uh, operation running in a, in a building. Uh, and again, I think we use phase in over time. We're going to ask this study to study exactly how impactful that would be. Um, I think that uh, uh, as a matter of fairness and equity, it's, it's certainly something we're going to need to look at. And and in the end, if if we want to exclude nonprofits, I, I just don't think homeowners and other businesses at for profit necessarily should be subsidizing but that's something that is policy we're going to need policymakers are going to need to make a decision on so it is going to be an adult conversation that, that that's going to need to be taken that's going to need to take place okay am i correct that the 1.6 million is already in the capital program and it's just being moved to 2020 yes it's it's it was entered in as a as a future and it's being accelerated to 2020 that's why it's a capital budget amendment and assess, necessary, uh, has necessary requirements to, uh, to approve the CBA. So all we're being asked to do now is to move 1.6 million from an under review to the 2020 capital project. That's my understanding. Uh, and I have a motion. To do that. Uh, excuse me. Can yeah, I? Go on. Um, I'm quite concerned about this. I don't see any specific consideration of neighborhoods that are surrounding these plants. Uh, and I understand that they're probably lumped in with environmental footprint. But I think there needs to be some special consideration of consultation with the neighborhood uh, surrounding the seven existing treatment plants and the impact this will have on them um, eventually, in addition to you know homeowner savings, but environmental and other impacts. Excellent. Specifically excellent. included for consultation. Yes, excellent, excellent point. And and they are under um, the stakeholders that needs to take place. The good news is 
this is going to, if anything, be level or less than, because if we can reduce I and I, you are going to have less flow, potentially less impact. If at the homeowner level, we can we can achieve some I and I reductions. So so it, it will not exacerbate the situation. This is simply existing sewer service. This is this is not an increase of sewer service. This is exi existing sewer service. And if, in fact, we can make a meaningful impact finally on I and I, you're going to have a reduction. But there's no question your point is well taken. And this is part of both the SY031 and more importantly, how the county executive, who is very, very sensitive to the legislature, and I know this firsthand, very sensitive to, um, it needs to take place and it needs to be a healthy dialogue with the uh, impacted communities around the existing sewage treatment plants. Yes. Yes, well, I would like to see it specifically listed because uh, we have been told a lot of things, those of us who live around the Yonkers plant, starting with the lie that it would be completely odorless. So I really would like to see us, the consultation and the consideration of the impact of, to neighboring communities and consultation with uh, committees that have uh, been established and neighborhood organizations. Can, can, I ask, can I ask, who told you that it would be completely odorless? Oh, you can read it in the newspaper in the 1950s. Oh, well, okay, in the 1950s, okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes, I. I have a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I am actually really glad that this came up because as uh, I'm from New Rochelle and you know, we have a large development and one of the things that's uh, barely addressed is the impact on the sewer system with the large development and the impact on the environment. So I really hope that, um, you know, with this new study, all of that would be looked at. Um, because it's really critically important. We have massive development and we need to see what is the impact on our current uh, sewage system and what is being done and then the impact on the environment. You know, our beaches get closed every now and then. And um, so I I'm glad that, you know, you're gonna be looking at this, you know, quite closely. The, the environmental, well, well taken, the, the word environment shows up a, a number of times uh, in the request proposal um, study documents themselves, uh, specifically a uh, director of operations, uh, Joan McDonald, the county executive, the deputy county executive, Ken Jenkins, uh, and, and the administration at the very highest level uh, has sent down a very strong message that um, this, this is uh, besides all the other financial considerations, operational considerations, efficiency, capital project and the like is also an environmental um, uh, consideration that needs to be taken into account and very much uh, they are concerned about that. So we, this is a chance to um, symbiotically and comprehensively deal with many of these pieces that everyone has struggled for many years to, to get a handle on. Uh, the, the department and the administrations do their best on it. But this is a chance to um, to bring some best practices and to see whether this consolidation can enhance some of some of the things that we've done and, and better things into the future. Hi. Any, any yeah. other questions? Yes, please. Um, I'm just I'm just curious. I mean, I'm very concerned about greenfield development, and I'm wondering if this is going to have an impact on that. Well, the study itself is consolidating what is. It will look at um, certainly uh, inventorying uh, each community and the discussion of what um, what development they are considering into the future, uh, as as underscored by uh, Commissioner Drummond earlier, as, as I indicated in 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 this discussions and her discussions all along. Uh, the issue of development is is there. Uh, and a consolidated sewer district needs to um, take that into account. Uh, we will now be a larger player in all of that, uh, and it's going to need to uh, uh, be that healthy dialogue and discussion. Uh, this, this in of itself does not um, incent development. It does not deter development. It is simply what is, um, how do we do it in a, on a better basis? But, but that along with uh, neighborhood impacts, along with the environmental concerns, um, the consultant's going to have to touch upon, and going forward, uh, it's going to be a real um, healthy discussion uh, that that county planning is you're going to have as a planning board, 
and the county planning department and other organs of county government if it becomes a consolidated county department for uh, uh, sewer service uh, delivery. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. And can I have a motion to do the capital project amendment to move the 1.6 million that's already there into the 2020 year? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Was that a motion? Richard, it's James, I'll motion it. Pardon? It's James, I'll motion it. Okay, thank you, James. Can I have a second, please? I'll second it, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Bill, please call the roll. James Arndt? Aye. Robert Barron? Aye. Dwight Douglas? Aye. Daniel Finger? Aye. Jimena Franchella? Yes. Uh, Gail for you, Grechen? Yes. Holly Hasbrook? Yes. Richard Hyman? Yes. Vincent Kopicki? Yes. Kathy O'Connor? Yes. Bernie Toms? Yes. And Rini Toback? I can only say yes with the specific understanding that there will be con consultation and consideration of the impact on the neighborhoods surrounding the plants. Okay, thank you. Let's make sure that's in the minutes. Um, okay, lastly, Matter for board information, 2020 census update, Ted, maybe we're running late, so maybe you can give us a quick one. Sure, we can, uh, we can run through this quickly, just an update of where we are as far as uh, census response rates at this point. Um, you know, Norma mentioned that the enumerators will start coming around in, uh, you know, just a little over a month from now. Um, so we basically have, you know, this, this time of, of you know, getting as many people to respond as possible before that happens, you know, and I think it can be helpful to sort of frame it that way. You know, the enumerators are going to come around to respond to all the households that haven't responded themselves. Um, so we're looking at the self response rates this far. Um, you can see that as of July 5th, um, the country was at 61.9% of households responded, um, but here in New York, New York State at about 57.4%. Um, so you can see that we're just a little behind the, the US average. Um, and all the states are now above 50% response other than uh, Alaska that was not on that map. Um, but looking at our region, um, basically we're at the, the same point compared to other counties in the region. You can see some counties, Bergen County, New Jersey, Nassau, Putnam, Fairfield County, Connecticut ahead of us. Um, and then you can see that we've had this sort of consistent order of counties where those three uh, New York City outer boroughs, Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn are the, the lowest response rate counties. And of course, those counties being among the largest in the state, that's a lot of what's weighing down the, the state average. But you can see even Brooklyn is now ahead of 50%. Um, moving on to different parts of the county and looking at what's going on as time goes on, I like looking at these graphs to sort of you know, hit home this point that, you know, we had a lot of response right around census day, you know, we sort of got the low hanging fruit, the people who were, who were motivated to respond on their own um, responded around now. And we are slow and steady since then, obviously much slower daily response rates, but still making some progress. Um, and certainly, you know, we are meeting or exceeding the national averages um, as we get closer to that final 2010 response rate. Um, I think that's a, a good goal to, you know, look at how we're doing versus how we did back in 2010. Um, so moving on to look at our uh, hardest to count community, Mount Vernon, um, they're now at 49.2%, so just a little below 50%. But if you remember, we were looking at the specific tracts in Mount Vernon that had these very low response rates. Um, about a month ago, there were five tracks that were below 40%. We're now down to only two tracks below 40%. Um, and you can see that track 35 that we had identified early on as being the lowest response rate track, still the lowest in Mount Vernon. 
Uh, moving on to Yonkers, obviously much bigger city, so you can see a lot of variation within different neighborhoods in Yonkers as far as the census response rates by track, um, but still looking at those, those neighborhoods in and around sort of the, the greater downtown um, southwest corner of Yonkers where we have those lowest response rate areas. Um, that one lowest response rate track is now 31.3%, so no tracks below 30% in Yonkers anymore. Um, and you can see looking at tract 1101 how its response rates have risen over time. Even though it's a very low response tract, it's actually getting very close to meeting its 2010 response rate. So it was a very low response rate track back in 2010, um, but meeting that in 2020. Moving on to New Rochelle, New Rochelle did pass that milestone of hitting 60 percent, so they're now at 60.1 percent. Um, and you can see that these two tracks around downtown New Rochelle that we had been looking at um, have very similar response rates. But what you, you can see on that graph is that uh, some response rates are driven by, you know, exclusively online response, whereas in some tracks you still do have a lot of the population who are responding by mail and over the phone. Um, so, you know, just a reminder that there are those three options for response, um, and we still want to keep the phone response option in mind. It's one that a lot of people aren't aware that you can literally call the phone number and respond to the census over the phone. You don't have to use the Internet at all. Um, so just looking at that going forward. Moving on to, um, I believe, Portchester. Um, so Portchester did hit 50%, with that 50.3%. Um, and we've been looking at uh, track 80 in Portchester that's in and around the downtown. That being the lowest response rate track is now at 37.2%. And you can see how uh, its response has moved along there. Um, looking at uh, Sleepy Hollow, Tarrytown, and Mount Pleasant, we had identified the track that contains grasslands as being one of our lowest response tracks. Grasslands track is now finally above 30%. It's at 30.7%, um, but it's still the second lowest, or I'm, I'm sorry, it's still the lowest in the county, um, but obviously a very special, different kind of track there, um, a special population. Um, so it's sort of a different challenge there of reaching out to uh, people who are staying or were staying in the housing uh, for New York Medical College students and residents. Um, so people staying in those apartments uh, need to respond themselves, uh, you know, so getting that message out, you know, whether they at this point have gone home uh, and didn't realize they need to respond there, another unique challenge, but that response rate is coming up as well. Uh, looking at Peekskill and Cortland, um, if you remember that Crompon Road area of Cortland was an early, very low response area. Um, and a big part of that was due to the fact that that is an update leave area, meaning that um, people don't receive uh, home mail delivery there. And just a reminder that the Census Bureau had not sent out anything to post office boxes. So everyone was given an invitation to respond to the census in their mailbox, but if they did not receive home mail delivery, the Census Bureau wanted to send actual census employees around to drop off their packets there. Um, so that happened a little later and that Crompon Road area, which had been very low, is still low, but is coming back up. So it's now at 45.3%. Um, you can also see in Peekskill that those tracks are now, uh, all except that central track are, are above 50% now. That central Peekskill track is still at 43.9%. Um, so just moving on to the northeast corner of the county, um, you can see, again, it's, it's a sea of blue, which means that no tracks are below 50% there. Um, the lowest is that central tract in the middle of Mount Kisco at 57.6%, um, and that Bedford Hills tract at 60.5%. Um, if you also remember North Salem early on uh, had very low response. North Salem uh, is obviously not a very populous place, so the entire town is one big tract. Um, and that track actually has risen and it's now up to 66.3%. Um, so looking at the municipalities overall, how we're doing as far as the lowest versus highest municipalities in the county, um, I also added a, uh, a line showing where we are versus that final 2010 response rate. So you can see that some of these uh, municipalities at the lowest and highest end have very different uh, response rates versus their final 2010 rates. 
Um, so even though Elmsford uh, has the fourth lowest response rate in the county, um, it's actually very, very close at this point to where it was in 2010. Um, and that's certainly, uh, you know, within reach over, over this next month, possibly. Um, looking at the municipalities that are the highest in the county, you can see that many of them have already uh, met or exceeded their 2010 response rates, um, such as Curtin on Hudson is, you know, 4.2 percentage points ahead of where they were in 2010. Um, so certainly some very high response in some of those communities. Any questions on, on the census process going forward? Are there any questions? Uh, keep up, keep pushing. I'm, I'm very disappointed in Porchester being 12 points below 2010, but I know they're working hard trying to get it going. Okay, thank you, Ted. Uh, are there, is, there, is there any other business? If not, can I have a motion to adjourn and thank everyone for their attendance at this long meeting? This is I'll move. Like, this I'll move. <laughs> okay, Dwight and Kathy. Okay, I think I heard everyone say they agree. So thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll let you know about next month's meeting about yeah. where, where and when. Thank you. Okay, thank bye you. now. Bye-bye. Stay well. Bye, all. Thank bye. you. Bye.